بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على من بعث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, On a day like this um, <coughs> Uh, before that, actually, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala He has a book called Iqtida'i Sirat Iqtida'u Sirat al-Mushtaqim Wa Mukhalafatu Ashab al-Jahim Which is a very famous book compiled by Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah Which is about holding to the straight path And being different from those uh, Being from, different from those who are Ashab al-Jahim Being different from those who are the inhabitants of Of the hellfire and in the book he mentions uh, a number of uh, dif different things how the Muslim, how the believer will be different from from the disbeliever and that if what every opportunity that you can that you be different from the disbelievers and then of course on a day like this which the disbelievers hold as a very sacred day for them then the Muslim should do as much as he can to be different from that and he mentions Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah ta'ala that even on their days of celebration, you should refrain from buying from them because it will help them in their celebration and so on and so forth. And on a day like this, that if we are able to do something which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be different from that disbelieving celebration, then we do that. And of course, the ayat that were read in Salat al Isha, and, uh, especially the first raka'ah, were talking about of none other, of course, than Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, warns those people who have taken a false belief regarding Isa alayhi salam وَلَا تَقُولُوا ثَلَاثَ that do not say that he is one of the trinity so how suitable it was by the Imam Zalakhir to read those particular ayat on, on such a day as this and likewise <clears throat> we continue about sitting here and talking about the ayat and the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the title of the talk, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to have mercy upon us all and to give you the best of reward and that he blesses all of you and he blesses all of your families. Quranic invocations or the du'as or the supplications that you find in, in the Quran. Now invocations or du'a is as Al Qadi Iyad Rahimahullah Ta'ala he says Addina Kullu that supplication of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in fact the high the, the entire deen. It is the whole of Islam to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a number of different ways. And when talking about dua specifically which is the silah al mu'min which is the, the weapon of the believer as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us of and it is a matter which no believer should ever leave. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book and in the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you find that it is full of supplications and invocations and encouraging us to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now dua essentially of course as the scholars have mentioned is, is of two categories. Dua al-ibadah and dua al-mas'ala. The du'a al-ibadah is that praise and exaltation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the servant will make by praising him, thanking him, and so on and so forth. And then the second type of du'a is du'a al-mas'ala, which is the type of invocation or du'a that you will make in which you will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a particular hajj, for a particular need. Whether that need is a need of the hereafter, or whether that need is a need of the dunya. So in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you find in terms of these supplications there is a guidance and there is a benefit للناس, that there is a success for the whole of mankind. And in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions and guides us to the path that which he is pleased with. And he guides us in giving us guidance in terms of belief and in terms of how to correct and rectify our acts of worship and also our akhlaq, our manners. Then in fact that this Qur'an 
and in preparation for this particular um, book, uh, th this particular lecture rather, that I used one particular book, which was uh, compiled by Sheikh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsin al Badr, Hafidhahullah Ta'ala. And his style of, of writing is, is a very simple style, and of course, his writings are generally very easy to understand. And I advise the brothers and sisters, those who are learning Arabic, that if they're able to find any of the uh, writings of this particular Shaykh, that they should try to get hold of them, because he talks about uh, very important issues and he has a very good uslub, very easy way of delivering that particular message. And the book itself is Fiqh al-Adi'iyah wal Adkar. It is the fiqh of making dua and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the book is, is essentially what I'm using uh, for this particular talk. So the Qur'an, of course, is the guidance and the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in turn as a guidance for mankind who came after. And upon pondering upon the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I had an opportunity that when going through this particular topic, that certain ayat are chosen that are to do with dua and that you have the ability to to listen to them, to read them, to ponder upon them, to look at the, uh, the opinions and the statements of the scholars concerning these ayat, and that they have so much more meaning. As opposed to that you pick up the mushaf, for example, and that you may pass a dua without really even understanding what that dua is. Or that you passed uh, a praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you didn't understand what that was. As opposed to now having an opportunity just to take a few ayat from the Qur'an and ponder over their meaning and the positions or the statements of the scholars on those ayat. So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us regarding this Qur'an, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْتِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَى That this Qur'an guides to that what is the utmost and straightest, أَقْوَى, the best. وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives glad tidings to the believers that those who do good actions that they will have a great reward so when you read the Quran you, feed, you, see, you see the message in the Quran you feel honored that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the ability that you take this Quran in your hand and you read over its meanings and you ponder over its meanings which is something that is required from you. And that when you were brought into this earth, you were brought into this earth, لا تعلمون شيئا. That you were brought into this earth and you didn't know anything. And that the amount of knowledge that is given to you is a small amount of knowledge. But that what the Quran, the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, takes you out of a state of jahil, takes you, takes you out of a state of ignorance, <coughs> into a state of of knowing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed to us Al-Kitab, the Qur'an, Wal-Hikmah, and many of the Mufassirun have explained to us that this also would include the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعَلَمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inform you of matters and give you knowledge of matters that which you did not know before. وَكَانَ فَضُلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا And that the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you all is a great favor and is a great grace. So the invocations that we find in the Qur'an, it is important for us to, to ponder over those. So if a Muslim when they read the Qur'an understands that this is a message directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it possible that any Muslim would then put the Qur'an to one side and not ponder over the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it possible after realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He loves to have mercy upon His slaves and wants them to be guided, that they would put the Qur'an behind their backs and be like previous nations who disregarded the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. And because of this, and because of this you'll find the scholars of the past, the rightly guided people, who held on to the Qur'an, you will find that they had a strong attachment to the Qur'an. 
Now, whereas many people who are given an opportunity or they're given a given holiday time at this particular time, and they use that holiday time for what? To relax away from work, to do whatever. But a number of you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you to this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the ability to come to the masjid to spend a number of days to read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To memorize the ayat, to memorize the verses that were sent down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just that particular thing is something you should ponder over and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guided you to that. Because how many people, how many people have that opportunity but didn't take that opportunity? The choice was given to them, but they chose something else. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fadl is given to some. And that is a grace or a favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to whom he wills. So our topic or the adi'iyah or the invocations that you find in the Quran, that they are many. And Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said concerning this topic, he said, يُعْجِبُنِي فِي الْفَرِيضَةِ أَنْ يَدْعُوا بِمَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ That it is beloved to me and it is liked by myself that the, in the obligatory prayer, that the person will call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the du'as, the supplications that you find in the Quran. But you don't do that while you are in prostration or while you're in ruku' because you're prohibited from doing that. So why in other places, while maybe while you're sitting in the tashahud position, you may state, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةِ وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةِ وَقِينَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ which is a du'a from the Qur'an. And Imam Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah ta'ala on this topic he also says, فَعَلَى الْإِنسَانِ It is upon the person to use that what is found in the Qur'an in terms of of course du'as and from the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it is blameworthy that the person would choose other supplications other than what? That what is found in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose and taught his prophets these du'as who are the best of people. So how is it possible that we can, we can leave these? Every single day, every single day, every Muslim who offers their five salawat makes a du'a 17 times, a day, 17 times a day, whether they know it or not, whether they understand it or not. They make dua. And it is his a'adham dua. The greatest dua that you will make. Whenever you read Surah Al-Fatiha, what is it that you say? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. That, oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. At the end of Al-Fatiha, what is it that you say? Ameen. Which means what? Allahumma stajib. Oh Allah, answer that what I have just asked. And if you look at Al-Fatiha, if you look at Al-Fatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us a great manner in dua. That ihdina sirat al-mustaqim is not the first ayah, is not the first verse. But we begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Whether it is the first verse or not, is a khilaf between the ulama. But then the next ayah, or the first verse, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I'tiraf al-abd. That the slave, the servant recognizes what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of the worlds. Establishing ar rububiyyah His lordship over his creation. And then he is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And that he is the most merciful, and he is the most, or the giver of mercy. Maliki Yawmiddin, the owner of the day of judgment, or Maliki Yawmiddin, the king of the day of judgment. That you alone we worship and you alone we seek aid. This muqaddimah, this introduction in the praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then there is the uluhiyya. There is the singling out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom you're going to worship. That he alone is the one that you worship and he alone is the one that you seek aid from. 
after this, and then only after this, you ask for your need. And this is from adab ad dua And this is from the manners. That when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, that first of all you should praise Him subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is dua al mas'ala. The praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your need. Imagine that you have a need from another person. That immediately you're going to say, give me this and I want this and I want that. No. Maybe you like to do something for them. To show them that you are grateful, maybe what they have done for you, recognizing the qadr of that person. And then you ask. So just as you would have a good manner with the creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more deserving that you have a better manner. And then you say, إِهْدِينَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. What is this path? سِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ The path which you have chosen, which you have blessed. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَلْضَّالِينَ Not the path of those who have earned your anger and not the path of those who have gone astray. If you think about the word إِهْدِينَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. Why is the Muslim now asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you? Why are you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the straight path? Isn't it in fact that you have been guided or you have embraced Islam, that you are a Muslim, that you believe yourself to be inshallah ta'ala guided? So what is the meaning when you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, guide me. Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that some of the ulama of the past, have misunderstood in interpreting this particular ayah. Because the Muslim, Kaunuhu Muslim, the fact that he is a Muslim, the fact that he is muhtadi, that he is, he is guided. So what in fact, which type of hidayah is it that you are asking for? He says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says that this sirat, this path that you are asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to guide you to, is what? The path upon which there is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the path which you stay away from disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the path which sharr or evil is taken away from you and that good is brought towards you both in this life and in the hereafter and al-dhunub that sins are part of your nature and that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to this path, the path of goodness and obedience, and the path which enables you to stay away from sin and disobedience and any harm that would come to you. So this sirat al-mustaqim, this guided path, is a much more detailed and a finer understanding as opposed to guidance as, a being, as opposed to being a Muslim and a non-Muslim. So this is what you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you further guidance, to make you steadfast upon this path, that you are not deviated, and that you are not taken away from this obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This in essence, gives you the ability to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He should be worshipped. And adding to that as well, is there any greater dua than that? Is there any greater dua that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are kept on this path in obeying Him and not disobeying Him. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you more guidance, grants you more thabat upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doesn't test you within your deen. Is there any greater dua that you make? This is why Surah Al-Fatiha a'adhamu suratan fil Qur'an is the greatest surah in the Qur'an because it contains so much meaning. And just pondering over just some of these ayat just enable us to see the depth, the depth of the Qur'an. And just, uh, it was yesterday, I was uh, watching a lecture given by uh, Sheikh Sa'd al-Shithri, Hafizahullah Ta'ala. He's currently in Birmingham. And he was talking about uh, translating or understanding the words of the Qur'an. And he asked the translator, after uh, he had said his piece, then he translated, he said, what did you translate the word as-sami' as? As-sami' 
which is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the all hearing. That's what I translated, that he said the all hearing. And who yasma' kulla shay. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything and that nothing is hidden from him. The Shaykh said, you've only given one part of the meaning, that there are two remaining meanings concerning this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when pondering over just one word, one name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you take so much more than just mujarrad a tarjima, just taking the translation of the word. That the sami' not only means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mustajibu da'awat, that he hears everything and that he will answer all of the du'as. Inna Rabbi la sami'a du'a. That my Lord is what? The sami'a du'a, meaning what? He is not only the hearer of the du'a, but he's the one who answers the du'a. And adding to that as well, that the sami' means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. When Musa alayhi salatu salam, when he stood in front of Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Asma'u wa ara. That I hear and I see you. Now this hearing is what? A type of what? Hifth, a protection for Musa alayhi salatu salam. So just taking the word as sami' and just saying it is the all hearing is such a thin and a shallow translation and understanding of that particular word. Now if you can imagine that this is just one name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have not gone into of course what is necessary from us to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is sami' and how does that impact on me as a Muslim, as a believer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything and he is the one who answers all of the supplications and that he is the one who protects all of his ibad. Imagine going through the Quran word for word sentence ayah by ayah the amount of fawaid and benefit that you would take from that. So this dua that you make ihdina sirat al mustaqim is the servant asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the best of this world, the dunya, wal akhirah, and also the hereafter. Is it allowed for you to ask the best of the akhirah, the best of the dunya? Do we want to go to one extreme and say the dunya is, there's nothing in it, you can't do anything? And so this is an extreme. There's a particular understanding that we should have concerning this dunya, this life. Yes, we take what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us regarding the dunya. That this dunya is only made up of what? False mata'a, false possessions. It's a deception. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa informed us that we should be like strangers in this life. And that we pass through this life as a traveler or a stranger. We take what is necessary. But those things that we do have with us, that we're thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in this dunya is a means, is a, a wasila for us to be true worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in a verse, inshallah, which I hope we reach, when we say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al nar. Oh Allah, give us the good and the best of this life and also the best of the hereafter and save us from the hellfire. So it is okay for you to ask from the dunya that which will benefit you and that which will take you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've underlined in so, so many more things concerning this particular uh, verse in, in, in Surah Al-Fatiha, but time is, is moving very quickly now. And I want to uh, go on to uh, another dua, the next uh, part of the thing that I mentioned here. And that is that when we're looking at the duas in the Quran, <coughs> That sometimes you find that there are du'as which are made, which are general du'as for the believers. No one person, or it was, uh, Allah subhanahu was narrating or spoke of uh, what this was said by a particular prophet, for example. This was said by a prophet at one particular time. I the reason for revelation. No, it is a general du'a for us, for all the believers. And then there are other du'as that you find in the Qur'an which were specifically made by the Anbiya, the Prophets themselves. And no doubt that the du'a, the supplications of the Prophets are what? Is the best of du'a. So you have the best of speech, which is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have the best of people saying the best speech. So you have the best of the best when you look at the du'as in the Qur'an concerning the Prophets. 
the best speech, which is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the best people saying these particular supplications. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no doubt, chose these people to be lights and guides for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says concerning, concerning uh, these prophets and messengers, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided these people and by their guidance that we will follow them. I.e. the prophets alayhi salatu salam in Surah Al-An'am in verse number 19. So the Anbiya hum al khalq wa khulasatuhum that they are the best of mankind whom were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is a must for us to adhere to their way as much as we can. Especially when we find the da'wat or the calls that they made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a number of topics. The supplications of the Anbiya were not something which, when you look at them very carefully, were asking for very much. You find that the dua, the supplications of the Prophets, were very simple, very easy supplications. And if we go to Surah Al-Anbiya, again in verse number 90, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course the Surah itself is called Surah Al-Anbiya, the, the Prophets, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a number of stories concerning Prophets. And finally, just before this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of Zakariya alayhi salam. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say concerning and if you know the story of Zakaria alayhi salam when he became old and wanted a child and the du'as that he made which we cannot cover we are not going to cover those particular du'a although we there are many du'as that we could have taken but I chose others Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us their state the state that you should be in every single one of us why? because this was the state of the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam when they were making du'a it's not just you raising your hands, making a talab, making a request, and that's it. These are actions of your body. But what is more important is the state of your internal self. When you are making dua. That when you're in sujood, for example, and you make dua, and you're saying things you may have said many, many times. How is it really that you are feeling when you are making that dua? As opposed to it is better for you maybe just to make that dua once but sincerely and understand and ponder over really what you are asking in the position that you are in. And as Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates in hadith Marawah al-Tabarani that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he went into ruku' for example he described the ruku' of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that the companions radiallahu anhum when they would see the Prophet alayhi salatu salam they would, they would look at him and follow him in, in every way that they could. And he, radiallahu anhu, said that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was in the ruku', you could see that every cell, every hair, every morsel of flesh in his blessed body was making ruku'. You could see that the ruku' meant something. And likewise, the baqit salawah in his salah, the rest of his salah, that when he, alayhi salatu salam, when he went into sujood, and informed us, we were commanded what to prostrate on seven body parts. That when you go into sujood, you make sure that your body is in this position. Because there is no better position to be in. There's no better way to show your servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than when you are prostrating or when you are bowing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the state? Because we are given the advice of how our bodies should be. But what about the internal state? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ That they, by the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam, that they would hasten and be quick to do good deeds. لَا يَتَأَخَّرُ If there was an opportunity to do good, there was a chance to do something good, even if it is something small, that you just do it. And don't delay it. Even though the shaitan will say you can do it later. If you have an opportunity to do something good right there and then, it's something small. That you're walking out the masjid and you check your pockets. Any little bit of change? 
That's only a few pence. Leave it. Maybe that few pence is the pence that will save you on Yawm al Qiyamah. <coughs> and that, that, that three pence that you are, you are judging how much it is worth. How much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that? Reward you for that? How much? That you don't know. That maybe you've done a small deed on a Yawm al Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you a jabal, a mountain of deeds that you did for that one action. And you say, Subhanallah, I did not think that one deed. That one thing I did would amount to that. One quick example. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever prays Salatul Janazah, Falahu Qirat. That whoever prays the Janazah prayer will have the reward of a Qirat. It's qirat. In one narration he says, Jabalun Awdim, a great mountain, may be compared to the size of Jabal Uhud. Praying Janazah prayer. How long does it, I mean, if you happen to be in the masjid, you happen to be in a place where there was a janazah praying, maybe unaware of the reward that you receive for that, subhanAllah. That you might see as something, a small action, but the reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you for that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the state that we should be in. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ That they used to hasten to do good deeds. This is the first point. Now what is your state? That the Prophet يَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَحْبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ Three things. That when they called upon us, the Prophet يَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا That they would call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hope. Hope for his reward. Hope for his success, uh, his acceptance. And hope to be guided. So that is the first one, hope. وَرَهَبًا And also in fear. The fear of rejection. The fear of showing off. The fear of doing something that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have the balance of what? Hope and fear. So when you're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is the element of hope and there is fear. And encompassing all of this, وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ And the state of you and with this hope and fear is that you have complete humility. Do you lower yourself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ghaya to dhul, ghaya to al-hub. That you have the utmost humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time having the utmost love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's important to mention humility and love. Because a person may be humble in front of somebody but hates them. In front of a tyrant leader, you humble yourself in front of them. But your heart hates them. So with humility, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not a type of humility which is just merely humility. But the humility that you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the utmost love. The utmost submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we look at the state of the Prophets alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us their state. And that verse is in Surah Al-Anbiya in verse number 90. When we go to the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the name of the Prophet, names of many Prophets, many great Prophets, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and Nuh, and Yunus, and Yusuf, and Suleiman, and Dawood, and the list goes on alayhi salatu salam, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We begin with Adam alayhi salatu salam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam and placed him in the paradise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told Adam alayhi salam and his wife, وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ O oh Adam, live in the Jannah with your wife. And that you eat as you wish, except for one thing. لَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ Do not come close to this tree. That if you do, فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ That if you do come close to this tree, don't eat from this tree, you will become from the wrongdoers. فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shaytan came and deceived them. And they ate from the tree. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
He commanded them all to go to the earth and that they would reside, they would res they would reside and live in this earth. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just send Adam alayhi salam in this state. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتِ So Adam alayhi salam, he met some words, he was taught some words, فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his repentance. إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابَ الرَّحِيمُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is oft forgiving and the most merciful. What were these words? We find the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam in another part of the Qur'an. This incident I mentioned to you is in Surah Al-Baqarah in verses 35 to 37. We go to another surah in Surah Al-A'raf in verses number 20 to 23 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the same incident that had happened between Adam alayhi salam and shaitan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the words that were taught to Adam alayhi salatu salam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ That the words that Adam alayhi salatu salam, he said, رَبَّنَا Oh, our Lord. ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا That we have oppressed and wronged ourselves. Rabbana ظلمنا أنفسنا We've wronged ourselves. We've done wrong. And that if you do not forgive us, and you do not have mercy upon us, then indeed we will be from the losers. This was the dua or the supplication, or what Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, that he asked from his Lord. For forgiveness. And this too you find in the beginning of the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah. And as you go through the Qur'an in many other verses, you find that many prophets, that they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. The prophets alayhi salatu wasalam, who are free from sin, free from error, but yet still what? They ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for forgiveness. As a guide for us. As something that we should follow. And there are many examples that you find in, in the Qur'an. For example, you find Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, Khalilullah. The close and intimate friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he alayhi salam with his son Ismail alayhi salam, that they built, that they built the Kaaba. They built the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the house that which billions of Muslims have made tawaf around. Imagine the reward that they receive for doing that. When they, of course, finished building that, they said, Alayhi salatu salam wa arina manasikana. And show us our rights, how we're going to perform the pilgrimage. And accept and forgive us. That verily you are the all forgiving, the all and oft repenting. And it's important when we look at the ayat, the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to us. That the, the suitability of the words that were used and that what comes after in mentioning the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when you supplicate, you use the proper name, you use the correct name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, <clears throat> if a person doesn't know anything, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a person says, Ya Razzaq, Ighfirli. Oh, the one is the all provider. Forgive my sins. It doesn't, it's just not correct. It doesn't sit well. Or the person says, describing one of the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya shadeed al-iqab Zawwijni zawjatan saliha Oh, the most severe in punishment, marry me to a pious woman. Doesn't, it's not right. 
Therefore, when you're supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you use the correct name. And you look at the supplications of the Anbiya alayhim salam, you find it is exactly as it should be. وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا Accept our repentance. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ تَوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ The tawwab, the name, or the, the sifa, or the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being oft forgiving. And there are many other examples concerning uh, the other prophets, like Yunus alayhi salatu salam, and so on and so forth. Time is going, so I'll choose, <coughs> I'll skip a few things I was going to mention. You just press it, I'll come in. <clears throat> the next dua that I'm going to mention, I've, I've missed it so much, but inshallah the benefit is there, is a verse which is, is in Surah Al Baqarah in verse 201. And I mentioned it earlier. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and these ayat, note, that they come out, they come after the ayat of, of Al Hajj. Al Hajj Ashhurum Ma'lumat. And at the end of these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ And from them, amongst them who say, give us the good of this world and the good of the hereafter and save us and protect us from the punishment or, or protect us from the fire. That in this dua, this supplication that you make, encompasses everything, subhanAllah. You want the good of this life and the good of the hereafter. What is the good of this life? The good of this life that you ask for rizq and halal, that you ask for halal provisions, and that you ask for things that will bring about ease when worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you conclude in it, and many of the scholars have mentioned that, that you ask for a pious spouse. Ad-dunya mata' That this dunya is possessions. But the best possession that you could ever have is a pious wife. That is the best thing that you could possess in terms of mata' In terms of things that you would acquire in this life. So you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a pious wife. Pious wives. Because there's lots of you. Also, other benefits or the the good of this life is what? Al Amal Salih. Good actions, beneficial knowledge that exists within this life, no? So you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And also the, the good of the hereafter. That you'll have ease if you have to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, in an ideal situation, who wants to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have the hisab read out easy to them? Who raise their hands if that's the first thing that you want? The first thing that you want is to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have your deeds read out, they're all good and you're, you can pass. Who, who, raise your hand if that's the first thing that you want. I can't imagine, maybe I can, there's other people who don't, don't want that. Those who are not raising their hands, what else do you want? Who didn't raise their hand? Fadl. Yeah. After the Qabr, when you, you've gone out of that, there's a Qiyamah. The second blowing of the horn is done by the angel and everyone is resurrected. Yeah. You want the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, khair inshallah, you will enter Jannah inshallah if your hisab is read out nicely and you'll be entered in the Jannah by his mercy. Does somebody want something else? Fadal. Barakallah feek. He doesn't want no questioning about anything at all. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that there will be 70,000 people yadakhunul al-jannata bi ghayri hisab who will enter the paradise without any questioning at all. The questioning is a difficulty within itself. 
So as a Muslim, when you ask for something, you ask for the best. إِذَا سَلْتُمُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةِ فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسَ الْأَعْلَى That when you ask for Jannah, do you ask just to be the last person once you enter the, the Jannah? Just let me be that last person. Do you ask for that? No. You should, when you ask for Jannah, you ask for the highest part. Because it's the best and it is below the throne of Ar-Rahman. So when you ask for something Islamic in the hereafter, you ask for the best. If you fail, خلاص, maybe it's a little bit less. So when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hereafter, the best of the hereafter, that you want to be from those people who are entered into Jannah without any questioning at all. Immediately. There's no question about your deeds. For as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about your situation, and you will be placed in the Jannah immediately. Anybody know for anyone from that? Can we say that anyone is from that? By name? Ukasha. Ukasha ibn Muhsan radiallahu anhu. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us about there will be certain people who enter Jannah without any hisab. That they don't seek cauterization and wounds and they don't ask anybody out ya la yustarqoon wa ala rabbihim yatawakkalun and that they truly have uh, trust in their Lord. What did we say earlier concerning the best of people? إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ That they used to hasten to good things. They go immediately to Jannah. Ya Rasulullah, make dua that I'm from them people. So anta minhum. You are from them. They never left an opportunity. The best of people ne never leave an opportunity except if it is khair that they do it. طيب. So this is the dua that we find in the Quran. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنِيَ حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنِ عَذَابَ النَّارِ And it's one of the most comprehensive supplications that you can make. One of the most comprehensive du'as that you can make. Because the best of this life, the best of the hereafter. Anything more? Well, on top of that, please save me from the hellfire. SubhanAllah. Anything else? Nothing else. SubhanAllah. So it's one of the most comprehensive du'as that you find in the Qur'an. And we find... In the hadith of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which is a hadith which is found in Sahih al-Bukhari and was a Sahih Muslim, that he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say many times in the Quran, uh, while he was in, in Salah. Very often he would say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ <coughs> That the Prophet ﷺ would frequently say this dua while in, in salah. The best time is when you're in sujood, while you're prostrating in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another dua I'm going to mention, maybe I'll make this the last one. Here's the verse which is in Surah Ali Imran in verse number 8. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> He said, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعَدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَّابِ That, O oh Lord, oh our Lord, do not deviate our hearts after you have guided us and grant us from yourself mercy. Indeed, you are the bestower. This is Surah Ali Imran in verse number 8. But again, to take the full benefit from the ayah, we need, we need to go back to verse number 7, the verse that came before it. And in verse number 7 is a very important ayah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays out what is in this Qur'an. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ That He is the one, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who revealed the kitab. مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ That from the verses, that they are clear, that they are firm. هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ That they are the foundation of the book. وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ And that there are other verses which are متشابهات, which may be unclear, which need explanation. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغِ As for those people, so the Qur'an is either muhkam or متشابه. 
Is that the clear or unclear? How do we understand that? The clear will explain the unclear verses to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As for those who have a deviation in their heart, misguidance, that they are just going to follow ma tashabaha minhu. They're just going to follow the verses which are unclear and leave those verses which are clear and try to explain that which is unclear without looking at the clear verses. This is incorrect. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْفِ As for those people who've got disease and a deviance in their heart, this is what they're going to do. They just focus on the ayah which is unclear. They're the ones who bring out the hadith to justify false practices. And they just focus. There's this one hadith that is narrated in so-and-so book. Forgetting about all the other verses or the ahadith which talk about make dua purely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are you going to the person in the grave? Why are you asking so and so? Because they bring one narration which is awl and ba'if is weak. Or is, mis is not clear in its dilala or what we take from it. So they just focus on that. It's a clear evidence that there are people who just focus on these obscure, obscure uh, things which need to be clarified. These are the ones that fi qulubihim zayf. That they seek to understand it and they seek to make interpretation of it. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the other type of people. وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ As for those who are steadfast and those who are firm in knowledge, not just those who are the ulama, because this is another issue. وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ وَالرَّسْخِ is that you're firm, you're not, you can't be shaken. What do they say? يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ We believe in it. كُلٌّ مِنْ عِنْدَ رَبِّنَا that it is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you understand it, then this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted you. If you don't understand it, amen nabi. That we believe in it. And we accept it as it is. Not trying to use our logic and our intellect to squeeze out things which is beyond my capabilities. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a hand. What do you mean? That the hearts of the believers that the hearts of the people are between the two fingers of the fingers of Ar-Rahman. So immediately they go, what are you talking about? Immediately they've gone to understand these ayat in a manner by their own logic. That there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not try to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his, his attributes. You don't fall in to making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like his creation for you then to justify to come out. Don't go into it in the first place. So the verse which is in number seven, وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلٌّ مِّنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُوا إِلَّا أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ and that is only those who have sound understanding will, will say this and have this understanding. After this, then what? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that rasikhuna fil ilm, those who are firmly in knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rabbana la ba'da idh hadaytana. Oh Allah, do not deviate our hearts after having guided us. That last thing that was mentioned was what? Those who are firmly steadfast in the knowledge don't take us away from that keep us firmly upon that وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً and give us from yourself a mercy because all of us are in need of mercy إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَبْ indeed you are the bestower and is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the guidance brothers and sisters is not something which is guaranteed as you are sitting here listening to my words what is to say that if something like this and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq the success to establish something like this again and again and again who's to say Allahumma amin who's to say that you're going to be here and this is something I mentioned in a previous lecture uh, maybe more than once that if you look at the time that you have been practicing Maybe it was early time in your practicing, maybe it's the first year, six months, or one and a half, two years. Maybe it's difficult for you to look back 
who you started practicing with and who remains with you. But for those who have the ability to look back for five years or 10 years or 15 years, or even 20, more than that. At the very beginning, you have this hamas, you have this energy and this ability to do as much as you can. And then eventually that you, you settle down. And then you gradually go up, inshallah ta'ala, up and up. Then you look back the years ago, where did these people go? These people that were practicing with those people who used to come to the masjid with you. The person who used to ring you and say, let's go to a dars. Where are they now? For this reason, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we find in the hadith of Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhuma, and also the hadith of Um Salam, Um al-Mu'minina radiyallahu ta'ala anha, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya muqallim al-qulub, Allahumma muqallib al-qulub, O the one who turns the hearts, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Make my heart steadfast upon your deen. If we realize that guidance is ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whom he wills and misguides whom he wills. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides somebody, or misguides somebody rather, if somebody misguides somebody, that there is no one to guide that person. So constantly you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep yourself steadfast upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast upon the deen. And then the next verse which is in Surah, uh, Surah Ali, verse number 9. I mentioned this and then it's the last thing I'm going to mention insha'Allah ta'ala. That there is another type of dua. But this dua is not asking for something. Immediately after the verse I mentioned. Or asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not deviate your heart. Then there is a recognition. رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ جَامِعُ النَّاسِ لِيَوْمِ اللَّا رَيْبَ فِي إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ O oh, our Lord, you are the one who will gather every single one person, will gather everybody on a day which that there is no doubt. Every single person, believer, non-believer, will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّكَ لَا تُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ But what is the point of this now? That verily you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do not, uh, you do not break your promise. But what is the promise? What is the promise? Of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not break his promise. But what is this promise? If we go to the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhu. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to Mu'adh, Atadri ma, ma haq, ma haq Allahi ala al-ibad? He said to Mu'adh, do you know the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his servants? Wa ma haq al-abdi ala Allah? And do you know the right of that the servant has upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, Allahu wa rasooluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. The right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that what? That you worship him alone. That if you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, that he will place you into Jannah. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you do not associate any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place you into Jannah. But if you don't do that, then know that the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive those who Associate partners with him. That the destination of that person who commits shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be hellfire because the person or this deed will not be forgiven by Allah Jalla wa'ala. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the person you're making this dua, you are the one who gathers the people upon a day which that there is no doubt, and that you state, O oh Lord, that you don't ever break your promise. And that I remember your promise that if I never associated partners with you, that by your mercy you will enter me into the Jannah. In this particular verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, or this verse is of uh, verses number seven of Surah Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions seven characteristics. Seven blessed characteristics concerning these people. 
The first one is that they have knowledge, ilm. وَالْرَاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ That they have knowledge. The second way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises these people is that it is not just ilm, that they are rasikhuna fi ilm, that they have, they are firmly established in knowledge. And this is a qadrun za'id. This is a level higher than a person just having knowledge. That they are firmly fixed in this knowledge. This knowledge that they have, they cannot be shaken. They cannot be shaken. This is the second characteristic. So knowledge, and second one, firmly fixed in knowledge. The second one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them of having iman in the whole of the revelation. Kullum min inda rabbina. All of it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have iman in all of the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not reject any part of the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't reject anything that may happen to go against their aql, if that is the case. Their aql is twisted. But they accept everything. That is the third characteristic. The fourth one is that they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them from misguidance. لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا Do not misguide our hearts after you've guided us. Which is the fourth characteristic. The fifth one is their recognition that in fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided them. Don't misguide us, don't misguide after you have guided us. So they recognize that they have been guided to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This isn't pr being proud and so Do you believe that you're misguided? Do you think I'm misguided, any one of you? Do you say I'm Baal Mudil? Do you say that or not? I'm misguided, I'm going to misguide people, do you say that? Or do you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided me to Islam? You do. So this is the meaning here. When you say that I'm guided, I'm not saying I'm promising myself Jannah, no means that you have been guided to the deen of al-Islam. That is the fifth one. The sixth characteristic is that they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً And give us from your mercy, which constantly we are asking for. And the last characteristic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises them with is that they have iman in the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have a meeting. They will have iman in that matter, of course, which at the moment is from the unseen. But they have belief in it. I just mentioned two or three, maybe four du'as from the Qur'an. I went through them. Murun kirama. A general passing by, if you like. Just taking some fawaid. Some benefit. Imagine now, going through all the different du'as from the Anbiya, alayhi salatu salam. Hundreds of du'as that you go through, subhanAllah. We just took a few. and We've been sitting here for an hour now, more than an hour. And we've just barely touched on the issue, subhanAllah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us all. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq, the success, to call upon Him with His names and attributes in a way that He is he's happy with. And give us the ability to ponder upon the Qur'an, to learn the Qur'an, to become people of the Qur'an. Because there is no greater people than the people of the Qur'an. Nusharrifuhum, that we honor them people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, and bless, Allah, bless us all. Please include me in that as well, my own dua. May Allah subhanahu bless us all, bless you and your families, and guide us, and keep us steadfast upon the deen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam, mubarak ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alaykum I said that the dunya or this life is mata' and possessions. Did not the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that the dunya is cursed? Yes, it is. Apart from some things, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa taala is not cursed, and the other things which are of course not cursed. So the fact that also that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the best of things that you can acquire in this dunya is a zawja saliha, any a pious wife, and likewise vice versa. The best thing that maybe a woman can get is what is a pious husband. Goes the other way as well. But other than that, is or could possibly take you away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Al Land. Wallahu ta'ala alam.
Uh, these, I mean, they've been written like in a statement form. I'll try to make a question out of it. Uh, a dua to keep away from evil jinn and nahr or evil eye and ayn. If you have husn al Muslim, there's not one dua I can give you. There are many things that you can you can do, inshallah. If you have the fortress of the Muslim, okay, if you go to that and the athkar al sabah, the the supplications that you do in the morning and the supplications that you do in the evening. The supplications that you do in the morning and the evening that inshallah ta'ala will protect you from the evils of shaitan. So I advise you to to, uh, to get hold of this inshallah. If you don't have it, then contact us. We'll try to get a copy for you. If you can't afford it. And financial support of wife. Is this solely the husband's duty to provide? Is the husband's duty, of course, to provide for the wife. She shouldn't have to buy food for herself. I mean, if she wants to buy extra food, that's, all, that's okay. But it's upon the husband to financially support his wife in terms of a second, that he provides a roof over her head, that she's clothed, and that she eats well. If she wants to do anything extra for herself, then that's fine. But that's her. But that's, the, of course, responsibility on the husband. Unless they have uh, an arrangement between themselves. Wallahu a'lam. Is it permissible to make dua in other languages other than Arabic in your salah? There is a difference of opinion amongst the ulama. But wallahu alam, that while you are in salah, you should only speak Arabic. Why? <clears throat> I mentioned two things. The first thing, the first incident is a, is a hadith, an incident which happened with uh, Mu'awit ibn al-Hakam radiyallahu anhu. The one of the companions, he sneezed while in salah. And he said, of course, that person who sneezed said, Alhamdulillah, which is permissible for you to say while in salah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say anything to that companion. The other companion said, Ya Rahmakullah. The other companions looked at him and was like, what you're doing is not mashru', it's not legislated in the salah. So for this reason, we say, Wallahu alam, amongst other evidences, you should only uh, speak Arabic while in your prayer. If you're outside of your prayer, you want to make dua in your own languages, that's of course, you can speak any language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no barrier between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless, regardless of your language out of salah. Now, you might say, well, I don't speak Arabic. Another narration which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, that there was a young shab, a young sahabi who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Inni la uhsinu dandanataka hadha aw dandanataka hadha. That I am not good in speaking why I don't have the eloquence of the words that are said. Dandan is like a form of mumbling. In Arabic, dandan is mumbling. That he used to pay attention to the Sahaba that while they were in sujood, that he heard them saying things. He said, I don't have the eloquence of what they say. They're in sujood a long time, I can hear them saying lots and lots of things, but. I don't have the eloquence of that. Was he an Arab? Of course he was an Arab. He spoke Arabic. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what is it that you ask for? What do you say in your sujood? He said simply, I say, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah wa na'imaha wa a'udhu bika min al-nar. He said, oh Allah, I ask for your jannah and I ask that you protect me from the fire. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, hawlahuma nudandim. Everything that we say, is around these two things. Everything that you hear people saying is around these two things. So even though you may not speak Arabic, you have in front of you and you learn, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah wa a'udhu bika min al-nar. Won't take you more than five minutes. Oh Allah, grant me your jannah and save me from jahannam. You want anything more than that? From the, the du'as that you find in the Qur'an, you don't make them in sujood. There's a prohibition concerning that and hadith of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which is an authentic narration. But we mentioned, just in case a person is then questioning or asking, I mentioned the narration earlier, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Rabbana fi dunya hasan wa fi al-akhirati hasan wa qina adha wa nar Did you not say that in salah? Is that not an ayah from the Qur'an? Is it not? No, it is. 
Aisha radiallahu anha said that when the Prophet ﷺ would make dua, he would say a dua which would be similar to the Quran, but he would change it slightly. Therefore, it not being an ayah from the Quran. So that part is not from the beginning of the ayah. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ Which is the beginning of the ayah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't mention that part. He just mentioned something which was similar to the ayah. Okay? And that, inshallah, is permissible. Wallahu alam. These all from the sisters? I think we should ask the brothers then, inshallah. Do the brothers have any questions? For the Rahi? Yeah. Oh, I mentioned um, the Sheikh himself, who has compiled a number of books, which his style is very, is very good, is very easy. His name is Sheikh Abdul Razak, Ibn Abdul Muhsin. Al Badr. He's a contemporary scholar. Hafidullah. I think some of his books is uh, one of his books has been translated into English, English. At least I know, and he talks about the raising of iman and how, uh, how your iman goes down. I'm not sure of the title, but it's around that. He's the author. Yeah. Sure. Are you? Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsin al Badr. No. I mentioned, it's similar to what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we shouldn't make dua while in sujood. Is there a hadith that mentions that a slave is closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sujood? So increasing your dua, that's also an authentic hadith. But there's no ta'arud, there's no contradiction between the two. There are many du'as that you make that you can find in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides, then do not the disbelievers have no choice? Seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for them to be misguided and seals their hearts. Inna Allah la yadhlimu mithqala dharra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not oppress an atom's weight of anything. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a person in his paradise, it is by his mercy. And if a person is placed in the hellfire, it is because of his complete justice. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you, it is because you are worthy. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides a person, that they are not worthy. Now this, of course, then goes on to other issues, deeper issues, which maybe we don't have the time to talk about, in that, well, where is the issue of, of free choice and, and, and so on and so forth? Uh, matters of Qadr. But Bakhtisar, and very shortly, in a very short answer, that if a person is entered into the Jannah, it's by his mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if a person enters the hellfire, it's because they were deserving of that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not misguide and place a person in the hellfire except that they were deserving of that. Wallahu fa'alu lima yurid. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does as he wishes. We need to question Allah Jalla wa ala. And he also informs us that he is of course he does not oppress anything. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be kamal adalihi if his complete justice does not oppress anyone then therefore if somebody is placed in the hellfire is it fair to us to say that they are deserving of that? La shakka fi nadam. Allahu a'am. What direction should one follow when praying, uh, when traveling? If you're, if you're traveling, then you should try to. You face the Qibla. You face Makkah. But I guess more specifically the question is maybe asking that you might be on a train or a plane or a car which is maybe turning a lot. Okay. Now if you're in a car and you're able to stop off, which by and large I think it is 99 times out of 100, you can stop off somewhere and you can pray. You should plan your journey. Not only plan your journey to you and to reach your destination, which you hope to reach inshallah, but before you reach your destination you have other obligations as well. And that is to offer your salawat. So plan for that as well. So there may be a place 
uh, a gas station, these kind of stop off places, you can pray there. Let man it, no problem. But if you want something which is frequently changing direction, then you don't have the ability, you know, the choice, that at least at the beginning you face the Qibla, and then after that there's a small change, then Labats, you stay in the position that you are. Wallahu alam. Yes, brother. Is that if Arabic is not your first language, <clears throat> that while you're in the Salah, the thoughts may go through your mind, and those thoughts, of course, will be in your language. I mean, are you suggesting that while you're in sujood, for example, because you don't know Arabic and you don't want to say anything other than Arabic, you just place yourself in sujood and have thoughts? Almost. I mean, you know the words. Yeah, yeah, of course. You have it in your mind what you want to say, but you're unable to say it in Arabic. So, therefore, you don't want to fall into the problem of saying other than Arabic. Therefore, I will just suffice myself with thoughts. Is that one aspect of the question? Well, I extracted the question from that. Yeah, khair, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, you know, regarding in sujood, akthiru fihi du'a or bid du'a, that you should say as much du'a as you can. And a du'a here, of course, is the saying of du'a, which would be the asl, the origin. And until that kind of time comes, and we've mentioned earlier uh, that you know you don't have to know a lot of different supplications. You can simply say. After saying Subhana Rabbi al-A'la And pondering over what that means as well While you're saying it, you understand it Like When you say Subhana Rabbi al-A'la In your mind you're translating it in your own kind of understanding Which is other than Arabic La ishkal is not an issue, that's something that comes natural to you There's no problem in that That if while you're in the position of sujood That you have a feeling of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And la shay'i fi thalik And it is okay but we're not talking about you just simply staying in that position and not saying anything. We say that this wasn't from his guidance to do such that, but rather to make dua or to say specific things while in those movements. And then in the meantime, while you are acquiring and understanding some of these supplications, uh, that... You, you say what is necessary, what you know, you, what you do know. Subhanahu rabbi al-a'ala, subuhun quddus, rabb al-mala'ikatu al-ruh. And other things like this, then, you know, uh, you should stick to that. Wallahu a'lam. Fadr akhi. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah,
and you follow the advice of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you ask for jinn, then you ask for the best, and nothing is preventing Allah subhanahu wa taala from granting you that. That Allah subhanahu wa taala is more merciful than you can ever imagine. لا تقنط من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Then never despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Why? Because He will forgive all sins. And if you, talk, if you want to talk about this topic in, in, in more depth, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in the hadith, and he gave an example to the companions, a live example of what happened. You know the hadith that when a woman after a battle was looking for her child. If any of you have children and you've gone shopping and you miss your child for a few seconds, your heart falls. Where's my child? This is how you feel. And then when you find them, you feel surprised, Allah, you're so happy. Even though they were there all the time, but you feel so happy, subhanAllah. Imagine after a ma'arakah, after a battle, upon which you see corpses and bodies and blood everywhere. And then you find your child. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said to the companions, do you think that this woman would throw her child into the fire? After finding the child? The, the, the Sahaba said, La ya Rasulullah. Then the Prophet said, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi ila binihim. Okay, maqala Rasulullah said. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful to the child, or more merciful to his slave at this time than the woman is to her child at this time. So never feel that you shouldn't ask for Firdaus al A'la. In fact, that the mushrikun of the Quraysh, they felt that they were not worthy to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything. Therefore, they went through the righteous, what they believed to be righteous people, that they would ask on their behalf. They restricted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. That who am I? You should never say that. You should say, Ana Abdullah, I'm a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I remember the verse, Fattakullaha mastata'atun. That I'm fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as I can. Then on Yawm Al-Qiyam you say, Ya, ya Rabbi, I did as much as I could. La yukallifallahu nafsan illa wus'aha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not burdened any soul beyond their capabilities. It is only a lack of understanding these ayat. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, that a person may fall into this. Yes, we are all weak. Yes, you are all in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but don't never think that you will restrict Allah Jalla wa mercy to think I'm not worthy and how can I ask for that? He won't give that to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to give you that and more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Is it a sin if you don't ask for anything? You don't ask for forgiveness and so on and so forth. Is that a sin? I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure if that was you heard in a particular muhadra, but if a person, sorry to stop you there. You have more to say? You have more to say? Um, I guess part of my answer would be if you're in the situation, for example, that the brother asks Allah khair, that a person believes they're not worthy and therefore doesn't ask, and that is because they believe that they're restricting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, how you can restrict the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Majus had. So from that perspective, possibly, by restricting and the, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, khatar is very dangerous. That's from one, one aspect. Secondly, that a person never asks for forgiveness of sins. Is that because they don't think that they have to? Well, that's another danger. And if they simply don't because for whatever reason, that happens, khatar is very dangerous for a person. Where they fall into a sin, Allah knows best depending on the person's understanding. But on some of those things, and if a person has that, it's very dangerous for that person at least. Wallahu a'am. What is the procedure in making yani, a dua, yani, other, other than salah? After you, know, you raise your hands and calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, the scholars, they mention adab dua the manners of supplicating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to face the qibla, to be in a state of wudu, uh, and so on and so forth. And there is a book in English, um, you can even find it on a PDF, as far as I know, on the internet as well. I think it's called The Weapon of the Believer, Dua. 
You know the book? It was compiled by Yasir Qadi. It's a good book on dua. It's a good book on dua. And within that book, it talks about adab uh, dua the manners of, of dua. And within that, you find you know, 10, 15 different things that you can is recommended for a person to do uh, while making dua. As I mentioned, to be in a state of wudu, to face the qibla, to raise your hands, to begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then to ask for your hajjah and to complete your dua by again praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Things like this I mentioned, wallahu alayhi Any questions, brothers? Yes, brother. Yes. Sorry, I don't understand. The first part is that the best time to make uh, dua was while you're in sujood. Yeah. yeah. Can you just, for example, I want to go into sujood and make dua. Just like that. The place of frustration. Yeah. There were certain occasions that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would supplic uh, go into prostration like sujood al-shukr. Okay? For example, um, if he was thankful for a particular matter, that he would go into prostration. Okay? Or as Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, that if uh, an issue uh, was uh, upon the mind of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَزِعَ إِلَى الصَّلَىٰ He would go quickly to salah. So, hypothetically, if you want to go into prostration, I mean, make a... Uh, So I had to answer that question really, Allah Alam. But there were certain occasions when the Prophet Edison would, would go into prostration out of, of shukr, out of thanks. And if an issue was on the mind of the Prophet Edison, a serious mind, he would go into salah as well. Um, and while you're reciting the Quran, you go into prostration, which is not an obligation, is recommended by the majority of the scholars. Um, I'm not sure I understood if there was what the question was about that actually. Is that, is that part of it as well? Make dua? Tadu. If you wish to make dua you can. Yeah. The brother's asking, Zahallah khair, that sometimes he has an issue of, of concentrating in salah. And that the, the shaitan comes to him, you know, whispers to him and he seeks refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan and, you know, spittle to his left, for example. I think there are many things which you can do uh, to, to help you and to aid you in, in concentrating in salah. And that is to, first of all, to recognize who you are standing in front of. If you can have this, to recognize that you are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that he is the one who gives and takes forgives and punishes and to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost and secondly is that while you're in while you are in your salah is to understand what you're saying is the person who asked the question leaving is it okay <laughs> I was just going to understand to understand what you're saying in your salah which will aid you in I've never had that before <laughs> <laughs> to understand what you are saying in your salah and part of what we went through today you know understanding al-fatiha its meaning which is something of course is an essential part of the prayer to understand what it means um, to understand that you are following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam which in itself is uh, a great ni'mah upon you and there's you know many things about, we continue saying about how to increase your khushu' in following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in as many aspects as you can in your salah 
to really implement the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, pray as you have seen me pray. So these are many things that you can, uh, or some things, uh, you can try to uh, instill, to practice, to you know, uh, increase your khushu in salah. And to read about the pious predecessors as well, how they would be in their salah. Okay, understanding Arabic is very important, so try to, try to all work towards that. Try to understand Arabic language, which will indeed, you know, indeed uh, help you in understanding the Quran and what you're saying in Salah. Allah. His brother? brother Zakalakhir, the brother asked about he feels he has wiswas, which will take away khushu, which take away his tranquility in the prayer. So to try and gain that tranquility, to try and gain that khushu, is to recognize again who you are standing in front of, to understand what you are saying. To implement as many sunan as you can in the salah as well. Okay, brother? Barakallah fiqh. Yes, brother? Thank you, Sayyidina Tala'u Kazi. Sometimes, the intentions that I get not work, and you feel it. You feel it focus on how you're trying to arrogance. Then you do that. Taking away this. While in salah, you're talking about, or just generally? Just generally. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, أَخْوَفُ مَا أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ أَشِرْكُ الْخَفِي The fear that I fear, the matter that I fear most for you is a riya showing off. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said this narration to the companions while they were talking about a dajjal The companions were talking about the Dajjal and what it was going to be like. As you find Muslims now, the talk about Dajjal, when's the Mahdi coming, and so on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ heard that, and he said, that the thing, the matter that I fear for you most is, not Dajjal, although that would be the greatest test that we sent to mankind, as an individual test. But right now, what I fear for you, I will be continuous, even before Dajjal comes, what is a Riyah showing off. And the Prophet ﷺ gave an example that a person will beautify their Salah when a person is looking at them, for example. So therefore, they make their sujood longer, or their standing straighter, or their ruku' more composed for that person. Any act of ibadah that you do, if you ask yourself, who is the one who is going to reward you for that? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala is the one who rewards. And this question was uh, actually asked as well, actually, to Sheikh Shithri, Allah Ta'ala, yesterday. And his answer was so simple, subhanAllah. He said, Antum in Turab, that you're from dust. He said, Are you not from dust? You're not from earth, every one of you? He said, Yeah, we are. He said, You don't reward anyone. You don't give anything to anybody. Once you realize that, you will not do anything for anybody. It's impossible that you would offer any act of ibadah except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once you recognize that, you recognize who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the one who rewards, it's impossible that you would... And how, subhanAllah, if you look at the reality of the matter, how belittling it is that you beautify your salah or you tell people what I'm doing in terms of my charity that I've given. Why destroy your deeds? That this is a form of riya, is a shirkun khafi, is a hidden shirk, and it only destroys your deeds, invalidates your deeds. Why do that? Why invalidate your deeds? Just for a few seconds that a person looks at you, and then after that what? <coughs> you gain nothing. In fact, what you gained is invalidating your deeds. So just ponder over this, who rewards you, and the reality of, of people. And that that person who you may be saying or doing something from has many dhunub, has many sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden from you. Is it okay to do wudu not in the order? And wudu from its correctness is that you do it in order. If you don't know how to do an order, then I suggest that you write down the order and you stick that piece of paper in front of your sink so that you have no excuse not to do it 
accept an order. Or if you don't happen to be at home, have a little piece of paper with you that you can carry around and have the order that wherever you may be, that you can do the order. So doing an order is a must. If also you forget a particular part while making wudu, do you start again? No, there's no need for you to start again. Rather, you go back to that what you missed. Okay? So, for example, you wash your hands, okay? And then you rinse your nose and your mouth. And then you do your face. And then you wipe your head. Okay? Oh, I forgot to do my arms. Go back to your arms. And then your head. And feet and finish. Allahumma. I also want to mention that, mashallah, there's a good number of you here. And we have also other lectures in Muntura, but this, not like this number, mashallah. I know it's holidays. And maybe some of you have taken out specific time. You live far away and then you can you've dedicate that time. But after this is finished, we have lectures every Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays in here. And all of you are welcome, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so if, you're, you, if you were unaware of that, you now know that, inshallah. And alhamdulillah, we have some of the brothers who attend those classes on Tuesdays. Wednesdays and Thursdays and if you need any more information you can speak to brother Naveed and I don't like to thank you know but I'd like to thank Naveed as well for the very much hard work that he has done Zalakhi and the other brothers who are involved in this I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them and, and, and give them the best of this life and the hereafter they've done a lot, a lot a lot of work mashallah and we should appreciate it whoever doesn't thank the people doesn't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala